We're turning to the Old Testament. First of all, we have some readings this morning, but they're very short ones. Uh, just a couple of verses all together. And we're at 1 Samuel chapter 13. First Samuel chapter 13. I understand I'm not far away from where uh, Dean left off last Lord's Day morning, but it's not by design in any way. Uh, I would like to think it's by the Spirit, if it's anything. First Samuel chapter 13, and we're reading verses 13 and 14. Uh, Saul's coming to the end of his reign, and uh, Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And that was one of the main reasons why Saul was rejected, because he did not that what God commanded him to do. And God expects us to obey his commands. Now turn with me to Psalm 89, please. The 89th Psalm, verse 20. The psalmist here, who is, who is not David, I understand, says in verse 20, I have found David my servant, and with my holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. Just one more reading in Acts chapter 13. And this 13th chapter of Acts is where the Apostle Paul is uh, rehearsing and enumerating uh, the children of Israel's exploits from he brought them out of Egypt right into the land of Canaan. And uh, in verse 22, we read this. He makes reference here then to King Saul in the verse before it, and the judges in the verse before that. In verse 22, he makes reference to David. And when he had removed him, that is Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And we know that God will bless to us the public reading of his own precious word. Our title this morning for this message is Two Words. God's man. God's man. And our text is in the 22nd verse of this 13th chapter of Acts. I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, 
which shall fulfill all my will. Now, I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, would agree with me this morning. If ever we needed men raised up off and for God, we need them in this crisis hour in which we find ourselves in today. Notice what the Holy Spirit, or notice what God says here. He says, I have found David, the son of Jesse. Now that word found implies that he had to search for him. It's the same word used when our Lord Jesus found the sheep that was lost in Luke 15. So here we have the eternal God looking and searching for a man. Do you remember in Isaiah on one occasion it says that God wondered? Could you believe that God would wonder? And he wondered that there was no man to stand in the gap. Is it any wonder he wonders? Because God's looking for men to stand in the gap. I have found a man. This is not some elders or deacons or boards meeting in the back room of a church. You know, the men that meets in, in, in a church and calls a pastor, them same men can get rid of the pastor. If a, man, if a man calls you, he can get rid of you. If he votes you in, he can vote you out. But here we have God finding a man. So the first thing that this tells us about David is that God discovered him. He's his man. He's anointed and appointed his man. And, and remember whenever Samuel came to seek David in the mind of God, that he passed, that God passed all the seven other brothers by. And went for the least that you would have expected. Even the godly praying Samuel, and mind you, Samuel was a mighty man of prayer. Even Samuel was fooled. Because Samuel said, there's Eliab, here's the man. But he wasn't the man. He wasn't God's man. Because God could see the heart And so if Samuel was fooled, we'll be fooled. And I'm afraid today across our land, there's many fooled. Because the church of Jesus Christ in Northern Ireland has suffered greatly with men in positions that were never put there by God. And you mark my word. But not, God not only discovered this man, he distinguished him. You see, a man after God's own heart, called and anointed and appointed of God, will be distinguished before long. It was only a short while when with the sling and the, and the five stones that he faced Goliath, and all the people knew that there was something different about David. Doesn't take God long putting his mark upon the man that he calls, and others will know it. But not only he discovered him and he distinguished him, it was God that developed him. 
How did he develop David? Well, the very same way as he's developing you and me. And mind you, this is not only, I'm not only speaking this morning to men or women that are going to be called out into full-time service. No, no, the man after God's own heart and the woman after God's own heart is every man and woman that takes the name of the Lord upon them. He developed him through trials and sufferings and, and storms. And if you're going through a storm in your life at this moment, and the fiery darts of the death, why I sang that verse twice, if, if these foes are attacking you this morning, let me say to you this morning that he is molding, he is making, he is equipping, he is developing, he is conforming you into his image. And that's the way he does it. And whether we like it or not doesn't matter. Do you want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart when you've got to go this way? You've got to go this way. But he not only discovered him and distinguished him and developed him, he delivered him on many an occasion. God will deliver you, my friend. He'll deliver you. Time and time again, and boy, he delivered David from some, as we would say in this part of the country, some handlings. <laughs> and then he directed him. Do you remember in 1 Samuel 23, when the Philistines had surrounded them at Keilah, he was at Wits End Corner, and he cried unto God, and he said to God, shall I go? God said, go. And I'll tell you when God says, go, go. He says, shall I go? Go and smite them. And he went and smote every one of them. God directed him. God will direct his men and his women that are following the heart of God. But it's not the fact that he was discovered and distinguished and uh, developed and delivered and directed that I'm after this morning, what I'm after this morning, and there's a sermon in every one of them, by the way, but what I'm after this morning is the way he's described. A man, I have found a man after mine own heart. Oh, ho, ho, that opens up a very great theological debate, doesn't it? Man after mine own heart. Yes, a man after God's heart, not after David's heart. <laughs> no, no. David, his heart was like your heart and my heart, above all things, desperately wicked. But after God's heart. But he found a man who in the depth of his heart really wanted to follow God. And you have to say that against the contrast of Saul, because that's the context. Oh, I know that David sinned, and I know that David fell, and he paid for it, and God made him pay for it, and pay for it all his life. But away down deep in the heart, because God looketh in the heart, away down deep in David's heart, God could see a man who wanted with all his heart to follow him. See, that's the difference. That's the difference. So, what do we see? Well, the first thing that we see about the man or woman whose heart after God is openness of heart. I, you couldn't say that about Saul. Saul was a closed book. Nobody knew what was going on with that fellow. But not with David. There's one thing about the life of David, he was open. And God loves men and women that have an open heart towards him. Tell me, are you open to God this morning? Because this is the first mark. 
There was an openness. There was a transparency with David. You see, friends, listen to what I'm going to say. Your eyes can be open to salvation this morning, and thank God they are most of you, if not all of you, I don't know. Your spiritual eyes have been opened, and praise God for that moment and that day when the, when the veil was lifted and we saw Christ and our sin and our Savior, and we're living in the good of it ever since. Our spiritual eyes can be opened. Our eyes can be opened to salvation, and our ears can be opened to instruction. And we hear the Word of God, and we do the Word of God mostly, and we do try our best to obey the Word of God. And so, also, our mouth can be open to confession. Yes, we can confess our sins, and our mouth can be open to supplication, and we can pray. But is our heart open to examination? That's it. You see, this is the bit that nobody sees or knows about it. Our hearts this morning. I have chosen a man after God's heart. A man this morning and a woman this morning who is, first of all, open to God. Now, let that sink in a wee minute. Are we open to God this morning? Are you prepared to say like David in Psalm 26, examine me, O Lord, and prove me? Would would we be prepared this morning to get long enough before God with the door closed and every distraction out of the way and just stay there and keep saying maybe all day, maybe a couple of days, Lord, search me, search me, search me. I tell you, there'd be some stuff would come out. Mm Mm-hmm. There would, you know. Maybe examine the way that we're living. Our attitude to others. Attitude to your wife. Your attitude to your husband, to your children, to your employer, to your parents. Maybe your attitude to tithing, praying. Maybe many things. And I can say that if we get long enough and get before God with an open heart, dear knows what he would show us. And everything that he would show us would be for our own good and for blessing for us and blessing to others. You see, the lovely thing about God this morning is that he's, he, he's looking, he's searching, he's calling. He wants to find men and women this morning that are open. Nobody dictating to him, just open. I'm open to God now. Send me to Africa. Send me to China. Just, I want to know the will of God. I'm open to you, Lord. Are you open to God this morning? Well, I think, you know, there's a whole lot of God's people and they know his word and they've heard his word and they know what they should be doing and and, and, and they haven't obeyed the word. (laughs) That's not an open heart. No. There was an openness of heart always through the life of this man, even though in his sin, even though in his days of of, of folly, there was an openness with David, a beautiful openness. Secondly, there was a brokenness. You go through the life of David and note how many times he was broken. And God didn't break him every time, you know. There's other, there other things that break you apart from God. He was broken, broken, broken. 
Sure, it was David that penned the broken and a contrite spirit, thou wilt not despise. How he knew that. Did you ever get before God and say, Lord, break me? Well, I would rather ask God to break me than ask something else to break me. Because God could use other things to break us. Mm -hmm. And those times that he used other things to break David... More than we would have time to go in to this morning. I'll tell you this, he used, God used his family to break him. Do you remember the child that was born to Bathsheba? Remember the days of praying and fasting and mourning and sackcloth and brokenness and weeping? Remember Absalom? His son Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son Absalom, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, oh, the tears and the sorrow and the laments of David over that willful, wicked son, for that's what he was. But you know, God used it to break him. See, God could see in this man's heart You never read of Saul being broken, do you? He was arrogant and proud. You've heard it last week if you listen listen to the mess. He's proud and he was arrogant and stubborn. Oh, my dear friends, this morning, remember, remember David could say, the hand of the Lord was heavy. You know, I often think about that. It was an awful thing when the hand of God's on a man. Do you know anything about the hand of God being on you? But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon him. I tell you, it was crushing him. Crushing him. So there's openness of heart. There's brokenness of heart. Here's what he said in Psalm 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. God used the family to break him. He used the foe to break him. He used his foolishness to break him. But I tell you, out of that broken heart, broken life of David, came forth the sweet songs and psalms of Israel. Do you know that the 13 months, there were 13 months after he had sinned with Bathsheba, that there was no song, there was no psalm. That was the time when the hand of God was heavy upon him. There has, to be, there has to be brokenness before there's blessing. Maybe as a church we need to experience it and the church need to experience it before there's going to be revival. Because there's a lot of things in our lives that needs to be broken. Pride, prejudice, haughtiness. I'm only speaking about myself now. And maybe we'd be better getting into a place where we'll get broken before we have any more missions or meetings or anything. Brokenness must come before blessing. Remember, remember, there's illustrations galore in the scriptures for this, you know. You remember, remember Gideon? 100 men there, 100 men there, 100 men there. 300 men out of 32,000. Get the pictures. That was the lamps. Hold the lamp up. 
Ah, but the lamps had to be broke. The pictures had to be broken before the light would shine out. Blow the trumpet and break the pictures and shout the sword of Gideon and the Lord and victory will come and blessing will come. And it did when the pictures were broken. Remember Mary with the alabaster box, a very precious ointment. It was sealed, completely sealed. There wouldn't have been a sniff around it. If you'd have put your nose around it, you wouldn't have got a sniff out of that box of ointment that she anointed my Savior with. But the alabaster box had to be broken. And when it was broken, the perfume filled the house. Hallelujah. Went right up into the nostrils of God. Remember the lad with the five loaves and the two barley fishes. And the disciples say, send them away. It's a desert place. There's nothing for them to eat. That's all the disciples could do. Send them away. That's all we can do. Send them away. We have no answers. Send the drunkard away. Send the suicidal man away. Send them away. Jesus says, give them to me. And he broke. That's what the word of God says. He broke the loaves and the fishes and distributed them out into the thousands. Remember Paul in that great storm as they're heading across the sea and he's on his way to Rome and the whole thing was nearly lost. And the ship smashed against the rocks. How did they get to the shore? Well, here's what it tells us in Acts 27. And some got there on the broken pieces of the ship. It was the broken ship that saved some of them. And when my dear Savior hung naked on the cross with the crown of thorns hammered on his lovely brow, and as the tongue clave to the roof of his mouth and every bone in his body out of joint, as he hung there in the, in the heat of the noonday sun and the vultures lying over him. I tell you, he could take that bread and he could say, this is my body. This is it, which was broken. Broken for you. Do we know anything about that? Nothing. We know nothing about this brokenness. Well, he knew what it was to be broken. Openness of heart, brokenness of heart, holiness of heart. Listen to Psalm 24 and verse 3. Who, David says, shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has a pure heart, clean hands, and a pure heart. Old Jeremy Taylor, if you ever get, you young people that are preaching, if ever you get a hold of Jeremy, an old book on Jeremy Taylor, it's out of print now, but you might get a second hand, holy living and holy dying. Sell your shirt and buy it. Holy living and holy dying. Holy dying. Need to finish well. You know. And lastly, openness, brokenness, holiness, submissiveness. Do you see what our text says? A man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. That's the man he was after. That's the one he's after. Fulfill all. Saul didn't do that. Not a bit of it. God, God, it wasn't God called Saul anyway. But this man's going to fulfill all my will. <laughs> Boys, I want to do as well. I do this morning. And I want to do it at whatever cost. I can say this, and I'm not saying it boastfully this morning, but every day, mostly of my life, I pray Romans 12 and verse 1. Here's what I pray. I beseech ye, therefore, Bertie. I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And I stop at the mercies of God. 
and sometimes I can't get started for a half an hour. The mercies of God. Do you ever think of his mercies? I therefore read the context before it. I beseech you, I plead with you, Paul says, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. It's not when you're dead he wants you, it's now. A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's a reasonable, there's nothing unreasonable about giving our all to God. There's nothing unreasonable about being broken, open, holy. It's nothing unreasonable, my dear friend, putting all on the altar to God, family, children, everything, and leaving it there. Nothing, nothing unreal about that. He done it all before us. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind unto that which is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. It's good, it's perfect, and it's acceptable, the will of God. It all boils down at the end of the day to submissiveness. And he could see this. He, God could see this in young David. He watched him as a boy on the hills. He, he knew him. He, he saw all his potential and all his typifying of the Savior. And all that, he saw it all. He saw it all. I'm closing, I'm saying this. A man after God's own heart will have a number of things about him. First of all, he'll be a man of faith. Saul wasn't. Not, not a bit of him. He says, I've got a man now. Well, here's what Hebrews 11 says. He subdued kingdoms, David, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, turned to flight the armies of aliens. Out of weakness was made strong. Could you got anybody more weaker physically than David? The shepherd boy, 16 and a half or 17 years of age, watching the father's sheep and these big men all passing by. It's not him. It's not him. It's not him. Out of weakness was made strong. That's where the strength is. Your strength will be made perfect in weakness. Don't be coming with your A-levels. <laughs> and if you didn't get them, maybe it's a good job. Don't be coming with them. And you parents, don't be all hyped up against your children because they didn't get some of them. God has other things for them. Let them alone. God's looking on the heart this morning. He's looking on the heart. This was a man of faith. I'll tell you, he was a man of faith. He, he, he wouldn't even put on the armor that Saul had. And he faced that Goliath 40 days and 40 nights. All Saul could do, hide in the foxholes and duke whenever this boy came morning and evening. He had made a laughing stock of him, just as the devil's making of the church today. Making a laughing stock of them. There was nobody to face them. There was nobody with the anointing. God needs a man with the anointing. Because I've anointed him. And he had faith. And you read the exploits of David. Yeah, he was a man of faith and he was a man of prayer. A man or woman after God's own heart are men and women of prayer. He says, I will call on to him as long as I live in the morning and in the evening. And at noon, I cried unto the Lord. 
do your study sometime on the prayer life of David. And I'll tell you what else, he was a man of praise too. Some of us can't even open our mouth to sing a hymn. You can't. Oh boy, I wouldn't say hallelujah. Praise the Lord in the meeting. And the he was a man of praise. He says, I will praise him six times and seven times. <laughs> you, you, you read the prayer life of David. I'll praise him with the psalter. I'll praise him with the trumpet. I'll praise him with the cymbals. I'll praise him with the harp. And he says, let everything that is breath praise the Lord. A man after God's own heart, he'll have a bit of praise in him. He'll have a bit of joy in him. He'll have a bit of life in him. He'll have a bit of fire in him. If a man's filled with the Holy Ghost, he'll, he'll not be able to keep him down. He was a man of thanksgiving. I will enter his courts with thanksgiving and his gates with praise. He was a man of the word. Read Psalm 119. Take a day and read it. He loved the word. Thy precepts, thy commandments, thy word. <laughs> Submissiveness, faith, prayer, thanksgiving, praise. We're on the road to revival. Openness, brokenness, holiness, submissiveness, faith, prayer, thanksgiving, praise. We're on the road to victory. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, who will do all my 